Of all the different types of MS that we see in clinic, secondary progressive MS causes the most confusion and quite frankly, makes patients and families the most scared. In this video, I'm gonna demystify secondary progressive MS. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started my YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today, I'm tackling yet another tough topic, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Secondary progressive MS is a huge topic. Based on viewer feedback, I've opted to break the content in half into two 15-minute videos. This is part one. At the end of this video, I'll include a link to part two. So let's get started. Today I'm going to be talking about progression, I'm going to be talking about getting worse over time, and these are topics that can be really, really uncomfortable for someone impacted by MS. Please keep in mind, my whole goal here is just to educate you with knowledge and information. And just because I'm discussing progression doesn't mean that's going to happen to you. In 2013, we revised the MS phenotypes, in other words, the outward description of someone with MS. We really describe two kinds of MS, relapsing MS and progressive MS. And what I really like about these revised phenotypes is the use of modifiers. So when we take an individual person with a relapsing form of MS, we then add modifiers to better describe them at a given point in time. We'll say relapsing MS with or without activity. Activity is a term that means a new clinical attack or new spots on an MRI. And so at any given point in time, someone with relapsing MS could have relapsing MS with activity or relapsing MS without activity. Progression means they got worse on their neurological examination, independent from an attack. Now when we talk about progressive MS, you can get there one of two ways. Either you can start progressing from the get-go, so-called primary progressive MS, or you can have a history of having had relapses and now transition secondarily into secondary progressive MS. For those of you that would like more information on PPMS, I made a recent video on the topic and I'll make sure to include links down in the description below in case you'd like to check that out. This video is focusing on secondary progressive MS. And an important point is that the same modifiers apply. People with so-called secondary progressive MS can still have attacks or new spots. And people with secondary progressive MS can also not manifest progression. So as you describe them at a given point in time, it would sound like this. SPMS with or without activity, with or without progression. Again, I really like these modifiers because I think they do a better job of accurately describing the human being at a given point in time. Pathologically, what's happening in secondary progressive MS? Well, there's actually a shift in the way inflammation impacts the central nervous system. When you think about relapsing MS, we think about naughty autoreactive cells that live in the bloodstream. They cross the blood-brain barrier where they gain access to the brain and spinal cord and they cause focal areas of inflammation. This causes clinical attacks and new spots on the MRI. As you transition into a secondary progressive state, we see less and less of that kind of inflammation. It can still happen, it's just way less common. But there's been an important change made. We believe that you have meningeal B-cell follicles. The meninges are the bag that covers the brain, and inside them, you can have clusters of these naughty B-cells that have set up camp, and they're pumping out autoreactive products, antibodies and cytokines and other things, and they create what we believe to be a smoldering low level of inflammation, which is locked behind an intact blood-brain barrier. Now to understand secondary progressive MS, I'd like to use an analogy of me blowing shotgun holes in a wall. So imagine the wall behind me here in my house, and imagine that I took a shotgun and I blew five holes in it. And the wall didn't fall down, it just has big holes in it. Now let's fast forward 20, 30 years. 
The structural integrity of my house is starting to wear out. Literally, the materials in the walls and the floor and the ceiling are starting to wear out. Which wall is gonna fall first? The one behind me, because it's the one that was structurally damaged all those years ago. This is the way that I like to think about secondary progressive MS. Here, I'm showing you an MRI of the brain. In the dark spots, we refer to as black holes. They quite literally are areas where the inflammation at one time was so intense, it ate away at the tissue, and you're left with structural brain damage. Over the years, the structural brain damage can add up. And as we age and our brain ages, those areas can wear out and we can manifest progression. Maybe the very best way to understand progression is to consider the leaking pool model of multiple sclerosis. My friend Stephen Krieger, who is a professor at Mount Sinai in New York, developed this model. It's officially called the topographical model of MS, and I think it is one of the most fantastic contributions to our field in the last 10 years. I lovingly refer to it as the leaking pool model, and I'm gonna walk you through it now so that we can have a conversation about progression. What you see on the screen is a cartoon of a swimming pool in cross section. You have the shallow end and at the other end you have the deep end and then you have the floor of the pool sloping down and I want to draw attention to the label number one. This is the, the level of the water and we refer to it as the clinical threshold. In this model, anything which appears above the level of the water, above that line number one, is clinically notable to the human being. So they have a symptom that they're aware of, can't see out of their eye, can't feel their hand, slurring their speech. It's stuff that they know about. Things that are under the water, under the surface of the water, or below the clinical threshold, the human being is not aware of. There's been structural brain damage, but the brain has rewired in such a way that they're not made aware of it. It's asymptomatic, but it shows up on the MRI. Label number two references the functional reserve, the amount of water in the pool. And I'll point out that there's less water at the shallow end than at the deep end. This is a representative of the functional reserve. The functional reserve is an important concept in MS, and it's really your nervous system's ability to withstand an insult. I don't mean an insult like you're ugly. I mean an insult like you have a fever and an infection, or you didn't sleep last night, or you're going through a very, very tumultuous psychosocial stressor. And it's the nervous system's ability to handle it. By way of example, I like to remind people that functional reserve gets smaller as we age. When I was 18, I could literally skip a night of sleep and I wouldn't worry about it. I'd just sleep the next night. As I make this lecture in my mid 40s, I'm exhausted just sharing that with you because my functional reserve has gotten smaller as I age. Now the reality is functional reserve gets smaller much faster in the setting of multiple sclerosis. The floor of the swimming pool represents the central nervous system. And what you see in the shallow end, in the uh, pink section, are the areas of the nervous system that have the least amount of functional reserve. These are the optic nerves and the spinal cord. These are very eloquent structures and damage to them doesn't generally go unnoticed. They're not very forgiving. Now in the middle of the pool, in the yellow section, this represents the brainstem or the base of the brain. This is also called the infratentorium if I use doctor language. And the infratentorium or brainstem has less functional reserve than the green section that I'll get to in a second, but more functional reserve than the pink section. Now, on the far end of the deep end, in the green section of the pool, this represents the hemispheres, the lobes of the brain, where there is the most functional reserve and the most opportunity for the nervous system to rewire itself. And so this lays out the basis to talk about Stephen's pool, the leaking pool model of MS. This slide focuses on what Stephen calls base effects. This is a way of graphically representing MS disease activity. Again, we define activity as a new attack clinically or new spots on the MRI. And in the model, we represent this by a stalagmite, the white thing, pushing up from the base of the pool. And if it happens in the optic nerves, then you'll see a white stalagmite in that pink area where the optic nerves are represented. If you have an attack impacting the brainstem, it would be in the yellow section. The stalagmite labeled number one, you'll notice crests the surface of the water. In other words, it goes above the clinical threshold. 
This would be representative of a MS clinical attack, where the human being is aware of the symptoms. In contrast, if you look at the stalagmite labeled number two, it's below the surface of the water. This would be an example of an incidental and asymptomatic MRI lesion that didn't manifest any clinical symptoms. Now we turn our attention a bit more to progression. Please remember that I refer to this model as the leaking pool model of multiple sclerosis. And over time, over years, the water level drops. Now, as the water level drops, it will quite literally uncover the stalagmites that are under the water. This is really the underpinnings of progression. Just like my example of blowing shotgun holes in a wall, here we have areas of focal structural damage. And as the human's functional reserve decreases, as the brain ages, and as the water level drops, we expose areas of previous damage. This would suggest that areas of progression are recapitulating old areas of prior damage. So with that preamble in mind, what does secondary progressive MS really look like? I share with you a story about a golfer, a guy that could golf three times a week, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. He loved it. He golfed with his friends competitively, but he shares that about five years ago, he was asked to no longer golf on the team because he couldn't keep up. He continued to golf. It would remain his passion. He would golf with his wife or just recreationally. But he found in the last couple years that he couldn't finish the full 18 holes. And so he would tend to do just the first nine. And this year is the first year in his adult life that he's not golfing. And in fact, he's starting to use a cane when walking farther distances. Now, this story is of a slow progressive decline in function in the absence of attack. And it's a story that you can only ferret out when you look backwards in time. You have to go back and look for a history of progression independent from attack. And this is the story or the feeling that we get when we're talking to someone with secondary progressive MS. There have been many, and I mean hundreds, of proposed definitions of SPMS. My favorite comes from MS Base. MS Base is a giant repository of patients from all over the world. And this particular investigation looked at 17,000 plus patients, and it applied all these various definitions to figure out statistically which were the most accurate. And they came up with what I think is the best definition. And there's three parts to the definition. Part number one is that the human being manifests progression, worsening on exam, independent from attack, that occurs over a period of at least three months. That means that you see the person at time point zero and they have a new hitch in their giddy up. They have a new problem on neuro exam. And when you take a history, there was no recent attack. When you see them three months later, this, the problem is still there. We've confirmed the progression over a period of three months. So that's the first one. The second piece is that when you do the full neuro exam and you assign them an EDSS score, Remember, the EDSS is the scale that we use to monitor someone's neuro exam, zero being completely normal and 10 being dead from MS. In this definition of SPMS, they have to have an EDSS of four or greater. And the third portion of this definition is that the functional system for motor function, which we call the pyramidal system using doctor language, the, the motor system has to have a functional score of two or greater which means that they have at least one or two muscles that aren't working. And so when you put that together, this turns out to be a highly sensitive definition of secondary progressive MS. And when they applied it to these 17,000 plus patients, they were highly accurate in predicting progression. I am commonly asked questions about prognosis. Hey doc, am I going to end up needing a cane? Am I going to end up needing a wheelchair? Will I one day not be able to walk or move at all? Very rational questions from thoughtful people that are concerned about their future. What I'm showing you on the screen is the multiple sclerosis severity scale. It's a scale that tracks disability progression over time. It was created by collecting information from 10,000 people with MS, mostly in Europe and Australia. It's important to point out that this was collected at a time when there weren't a lot of MS medicines. And in fact, most of the 10,000 people weren't on a disease modifying therapy. Also, 
those that were on a disease modifying therapy were only on the initial injectable therapies, which we now view as low efficacy. So in essence, what this scale allows us to do is to see the natural history of multiple sclerosis. What happens if you don't treat? And what we find is the person follows their color. If you look at the way the scale is set up, across the top going left to right is the disability scale. Zero is on the left and death from MS, a 10, is on the far right. Now, as you look going from top to bottom, we get older as we go down the scale. That represents years. So if you find that someone has an EDSS that puts them in that red color, an EDSS of 2.5 in the first year, the natural history of the disease would be to follow their color. And you can see as you go down that they shift to the right. This is the natural history of the disease, and it is our opinion, our strong opinion, that applying medicines, particularly the highly effective medicines early on, allows you to beat the curve. Instead of following your color, we want to hold you static so that you don't progress as you get older. This is a helpful tool I find when talking to patients and families to show them A, what to expect if we don't treat, and B, our goals for treatment. This feels like a good place to stop video number one. There's a link right here that you should click immediately to launch into the second half of this series, where you're gonna learn about how we treat secondary progressive MS. So watch that video and I'll catch up with you guys later. And until my next video or live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying thank you for learning about MS with me and take care.